Welcome again to ATO's Rapid Fire Interviews. Um, for those of you who have not seen any of the episodes so far, basically I get online uh, via Zoom and interview some well-known dog personalities um, across in our section and across the world. And Rapid Fire is I ask quick questions, short answers, certain things I'll ask them our invited guests to elaborate on and um, it's basically an opportunity for us to get to know our guests better for you to get to know them for us to have a little bit of fun and uh, as most of us are in some form of lockdown or quarantine during this period um, so it's just a way to keep things moving along and interesting so today uh, we have uh, Andrew Burt all the way from Melbourne Australia joining us hi Andrew how are you hi Goppy how are you I'm good, thank you. Um, I'm just going to say that I love that painting and it's so kind of you to offer it to me. Um, you know, it's, it's very <laughs> nice of you. <laughs> you like it? I've just had a reframe for the new house and it's come up well. It's Aboriginal. I love it. I absolutely love it. I think it's, it's got a, a great energy. Andrew, well, um, I mean, uh, the most obvious um, question I can start off with, an odd question, but topic I'd, I just want to bring up is um, uh, obviously last week, the um, Royal Melbourne show officially came out and said that they've cancelled it. Um, uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of mixed emotions about that uh, with you. Can you just tell us a little bit of how you feel and, and um, you know, just on that topic? Yeah. Look, um, it's been on the cards for a while and I don't make that decision. It's made by the RRA, Royal Agricultural Society board. Okay. Um, by the time the decision was made, I was hoping the decision would be that it was cancelled because, you know, our judges aren't going to get visas. I don't know whether they'll be able to travel. It's a very big show, um, more than just dogs, with something like 800,000 people going through. And I don't know where the people go this year. So uh, what the, the, per the people I feel sorry for are the judges because we have very long contracts. Some of them have waited five years and um, the show's cancelled. So hopefully I can uh, slot them in somewhere in the future. But we're just planning on coming back bigger and better in 21 and all the major royals have been cancelled for the year. Yeah, I mean, this, this year the whole, uh, I don't think there's any royal that's running, uh, or, or at least that I know of. Um, so they've all been cancelled. Um, which is unfortunate. Has there ever been a time when has there ever been a time when uh, royals have Adelaide, Sydney? I think during the war it might have happened, Goppy, well before my time. But that someone said during the war. Okay. But uh, Adelaide is still to cancel, I think. But Brisbane, Sydney, and now Melbourne have cancelled, and there are smaller. Perth is on about the same time as us, but I presume they'll all go because I don't know whether our borders will be open for international travel, you know, by that time. Very sad. I mean, that's the thing, they're all, all our countries are, have shut their borders at this point. So only citizens coming back um, and, uh, you know, those necessary travel, unless uh, other than that, they're not allowing anyone. So, yeah. Well, yeah, I, think, I think tough call, tough call, but I think a necessary one. And as you say, better earlier than, you know, closer to the date when people are trying to make plans and then plans get, you know, um, messed around. We, we really wanted to, uh, to be able to make the decision before we put our schedule out and started taking entries and we've been able to do that. Okay, excellent. All right, well, let's just jump into the interview then. Um, so, okay, rapid fire. Favourite food? Pasta. Pasta, okay. A favourite drink? White wine, Pinot Grigio. <laughs> okay, nice one. That's a good drop. Um, if you could live anywhere in the world, except Australia, where would it be? <sighs> you know, I was pretty keen on, uh, on Finland and Helsinki and areas like that. So that would be a consideration. Excellent. Um, Coke or Pepsi? Unfortunately, Coke. Okay, but I don't have it very often at all. Okay, KFC or McDonald's? KFC, I wouldn't touch McDonald's. Okay, all right. Do you have a favorite book that you've read a couple of times? Um, I read uh, lots of interesting books and um, the one that I have just read was called The Tattooist of Auschwitz okay. and I loved it. 
Pardon? Who was the author? I don't know what the author's name was. I'm not very good on authors. Okay. But it was a great book. Okay. What's the first thing you notice about someone when you first meet them? Their face and their smile. Okay. Good answer. Good answer. Um, and who's your favourite superhero and why? Do you know, I've got a friend who's very keen on superheroes and they're really not my thing. Okay. But I suppose I'd have to say um, Superman, but only because, you know, that was the first, you know, I remember Clark Kent yeah. and watching all the, super, the Superman series way back. I was all pretty right. keen on that. Well, I sort of say that sort of hero. Um, how, how did you, Andrew, can you just briefly tell us how you got involved with the, the world of pedigree dogs or how did you got your first pedigree dog? Are you, you know, is it family or uh, was, you know, how did that happen? Um, my family were nothing to do with um, the dog world and weren't even that keen on dogs. And uh, after a lot of pleading, I got my first dog, which was a Labrador. And she was actually, uh, her dam was a Sandylands bitch who was in Australia. And uh, her name was Sandylands Greta. And her father was hmm, Diant Jay's Green Jasper, another dog from England. And she was bred by the late Dorothy Such of Dufton Kennels. And I bought her as a pet and she was de-sexed. And um, dog shows came after that. I worked for someone with dogs out after school, walking their dogs and went to a dog show and um, the rest is history. And, and so my what, parents what had breeds, nothing to do with them. And what breeds have you been involved with over the years? Well, the first person I worked for was a lady whose name was Rosemary Daggerston and is now known as Pia Kirk. And she had Shih Tzus and Poodles. And I won my first Royal Challenge with a Shih Tzu that I was showing for her. And um, then I worked for a lady named Joy Stevenson who had two bull mastiff imports from England from the famous bull staff kennels of um, Ralph Short. And uh, it went from there. And since then, really, it's focused a long time around bull mastiffs. Um, not really as a breeder. I bred a couple of others, but not many. And then the last 20 years with Shebas and uh, with a, a intermingling of whippets. I'm pretty keen on the old whippet too. Okay. And, and if you were to own another breed, what would the next one be? I know that, you know, my last Sheba has just, you know, has, has gone recently at 16. Two old bitches I had who've gone. And I've got a couple of breeding ones out there, but I want um another dog now i've decided not to show as an all breeds judge so i'm really just going to get a companion and it will be a black mini poodle bitch okay. but not for showing okay i want a dog that doesn't lose its coat in the <laughs> house and they're great size and intelligent yeah and um, so if i buy one from one with uh you know Good health. I want something with you know good health testing, yeah. and then I'll be right. Excellent. And you brought up an interesting topic. So, um, do you do you think um, judges should not show dogs then actively? Oh, you know, there are many judges that would not judge if they couldn't show their dogs, and that is perfectly fine. Um, I I think that very often. Uh, People newer to the dog world are very quick to assume that judges are winning because they're judges. But I think that quite often judges who've obviously been in the dog world a long time have great dogs. And if they want to show, that's fine. But for me, it just suits me as an all-breed judge to, um, to not go in the ring, uh, you know, or very, very infrequently. Fair. But I've got no problem with someone doing that. Okay. So... Um... What FCI grading would you give to James Dean? Could you repeat that question, please? What, what FCI grading would you give to James Dean? The actor? Yes. An excellent. <laughs> Absolutely. He was a legend. Well, what about Sean Connery then? He'd probably get a double excellent. 
<laughs> I'm making a new gravy. So, so the cussip goes to Sean Connery, obviously, then, between the two of those. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Is, is there such a thing as objective beauty? I'm not sure on that one, Goppy. Okay. Good. Very hard cream. thing to... Uh, Sorry, go on, Andrew. That's a very hard thing to decide. Um, but beauty is in the eye of the beholder and there is a certain degree that is ob objective and there's a, a great big degree that's subjective. And that happens with dogs too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, ice cream or frozen yogurt? Oh, absolutely ice cream. Absolutely. What, what flavour? Chocolate. Chocolate. I thought you were going to say something exotic, but yeah, okay, chocolate, that's, that's exotic. Um, I'm a very straightforward lover of ice cream. Only way to be. Um, how do you like your steak cooked? Uh, medium. Medium to medium rare. But I certainly would not be eating blue steak or, or anything that was too rare. <laughs> what was the best advice you were given as an exhibitor? When you started showing dogs, what was the best advice someone gave you? Yeah. Um, I had two bits of great advice. Um, well, one's, well, I won't, one of them's more to a breeder. That might be a question you're going to ask in a minute. But as an exhibitor, it was to let your dog shine. Let your dog speak for itself. Don't show yourself, show the dog, and don't stand out. Let the dog stand out. And I think that's really really important. I don't care if a person's wearing jeans and runners or what they're wearing. It's the dog that's important. And the, some people show themselves more than the dog and some people don't make the dog the hero and I want the dog to be the hero. That's, that's a very good point actually because I, I, I think there's a fine line between dressing up decently and trying, to, um, trying to sort of um, grab the attention of the judge with your yeah whatever colour suit. And, and what about advice as a breeder? What was the best oh, advice? You absolutely. The advice that was, was given to me and the first bit of advice I would always give is buy from a good bitch line. Buy a bitch from a good bitch line. The rest of it can come. But I was very lucky in Sheba's that the, um, the first bitch I bought was um, from a good bitch line, but... Um, I was lucky enough to secure her mother and that was from a line of, of bitches and I've been able to produce on, on a line of bitches and many of them don't get shown because I, I don't sell any dogs for show dogs, but they breed true and I just think a good bitch line is gold. Absolutely. You can use a dog from anywhere around the world, but you can't, um, you can't produce without, uh, continually well, uh, without a bitch. I often say, you know, the stud dogs, I, as, as I'm not downplaying their importance, but I often say they're just Bobo, the sperm, sperm donor, you know? Um, it's the bitches that... Absolutely. And what, what, what's the best advice you were given as a judge when you started judging? Judge the dog on the day in the ring. That's great. Never preconceived ideas. Never assuming that's the dog that you've seen before and it'll be the best in the ring. Look along that lineup and find the best dog on the day in the ring. Absolutely. I think that's really important. Yeah, that's fabulous advice. Sunrise or sunset? Sunrise. I'm an early riser. <laughs> I love sunrise. All right, something a little deeper. Three things about yourself you'd like to change. Oh, there's so many goppy. <laughs> well, let's, um, let's, let's pick three. Where would I start? I can be too pedantic. Okay. I can be too picky. And at times I know I have to tell myself that I need to just settle and accept things for what they are. I know that I have to be careful I don't speak over people. Sometimes I'm very enthusiastic with my opinion and I need to take that step back and listen before I reply. I'm, I'm loving the honesty here. Um, all right, texting or talking? You know, I text a lot, but I think that the art of talking is being lost through social media and texting. And I think it's very important 
to talk to your family and friends. It doesn't matter past, I'm not worried past that, but you have to be very careful to keep in, on a one-to-one -one with family and friends and make sure that you talk. I'm a, I'm a school teacher. I know and I see what happens at schools with, um, with uh, devices. And our school has this year adopted a new policy where no devices, no phones are used between 8.30 a.m. and the last bell, and it's made a big difference. You see it in the yard. You see the students actually talking. Because I, 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 you know, I often feel that, um, you know, sometimes texting is just a quick way to feel that you're connecting with someone, but without putting the effort into actually having a conversation. Because as you said, it's an art to have a conversation. You know, so it's a quick way out. All right. You know, sometimes it's okay, but with, with family and friends who are the important ones, you need to go that step further. I agree. Um, what's the strangest thing you've ever eaten? Oh. Well, I wasn't too keen on shark fin um, soup, which I had in Japan, and I had some of the soup, but I would not eat the shark fin. So I wasn't very keen on that. And uh, I'm no fan of um, chicken feet. <laughs> Why? Boring. <laughs> I'll eat lots of things, but chicken feet, I, they, they don't do it. Why? Is it, is it the texture or is it the thought of where those feet have been? I never even thought about where the feet had been. It's the texture and that, that little claw in front of you. No, it's not for me. <laughs> well, we'll just have to make sure they clip off the claw next time before they serve it to you. Um, <laughs> siblings. Have you got any siblings? I have. Um, I had two siblings. I have a sister who I love very dearly, who has also, she has a partner and two daughters, 21 and 23, and they are fantastic. I did have a brother, 18 months younger than me, but horrifically he died in Africa 30 years ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And are you, are you the oldest? Are you the oldest in the family? I'm the oldest, the next, and my sister's the youngest. Okay. I'm very lucky that my parents are still alive. Wow. 90, 92 and 85. Wow. Um, they do live in care now. I've just moved in and done up their house and just, uh, you know, I bought their house when they, when they moved into care. That's nice. A bit of a, um, you know, the, the, the house, at least something, you know, it keeps up a little bit of a, um, what's the word? Anyway, you know what I'm trying to say. All right. Yeah, I know what you Point scores and top dog competitions death of the of the dog world and encouraging the wrong form of competition you know i i, I help in a way with um the victorian top dog competition in the top dog night which is called the night of nights mm. and that's okay if you've won a best in show in at a specialty or an all breeds or a, a, a group show you can compete for that and i have no problem with that and they do it for the puppies as well but i think that year-long point scores are I, I i i am not for them i think they they breed um, animosity and over competition and they make people do things that they wouldn't normally do rather than going and enjoying a show. And I think that we would be much better off without them. Can you, can you say that there's clearly been a difference in the atmosphere uh, in, in dog shows now that um, things are more point score driven as opposed to how they were before where people just came in and, and, and had fun and, you know, showed their dogs, socialised and, and went home? Well, not really, because if you take it, a dog show in Melbourne with a thousand dogs, there'd, be, there'd only be a hundred or 150 that are worried about, you know, that are at the top of the point score and, and concerned about those things. So for a lot of the people there, it's still um, a day out with their dogs that they love and they compete and they hope they'll win and they have a good day and they congratulate the others. But I think there's a, a tier at the top that is, um, you know, very orientated towards winning that point score. And it's a, you know, a, for some of them, it's a win at all costs. And, and that's, that's what, you know, drives them. And, and just I think that's question. a bit of a shame. 
Another and question. I, and I do. Sorry, go ahead, Andrew. Sorry. I do think that the competition at breed level is very, very important, and that the other, you know, the group level and the in show level is is fantastic, but it's breed level that's really important, and so than in Europe, it's it's forgotten. And and you've actually um, touched on one of my next questions, um, which was going to be. If dog shows ended best of breed, would we would it make the sport grow or decrease in popularity? Big question, Goppy. Big question. Um, I actually don't know. I think it would be very interesting to know, but I don't know the answer to that. I think that the majority of people go along hoping they'll win within their breed, so maybe it wouldn't have a large effect. Some, you know, if, if we look around a, a ring, there are some people that are not even dreaming about winning best in group. They're just dreaming about their breed. So maybe it would flourish. I'm not sure. It would but be an you, interesting did, scenario. Did you, do you think so? I mean, I, I, uh, when I first started, you know, okay, it wasn't that long ago, but um, people would, uh, for me, winning, winning the, the, the class, winning the challenge was, was a big thing. Uh, obviously, as you move on, then your, your, your goalposts shift a little bit. Um, but I find nowadays, talking to some people who are new to dog shows, um, their eyes on the best in show. I mean, like, they've come there to win best in show. Um, do you think that's also changed? I mean, over time, yep. the people are less... Absolutely. I think that in the early days when I was involved, which is you know, some, I don't know, 45 years ago now, um, most people did not even have those things in their mind. But maybe with social media and the hype that goes along with those sort of things and the advertising of wins, that um, you know, people do, do see that as more of a goal. I mean, we all thought that we'd like to win, but it wasn't really that important. It was a long way removed from any of us in, in the start, which I think was a good thing. Um, but times have changed and people come in and sometimes, you know, those ones, those flyers that buy a, a good dog in the first occasion and move very quickly, very fast, yeah. they, um, they get to a stage where they're almost ahead of their knowledge and experience. Yeah. Well, I just find there's a lot of um, internet experts these days as well. Um, you know, people jumping ahead. Yeah. You know. so. Yep. Totally. All right, let's move along. Um, what makes you happy? Uh, my dogs, okay. my family. Um, I love going to dog shows and I absolutely do love the judging. I get, I get a lot of, um, I get a lot of pleasure and I get a lot of enjoyment from going places and judging and talking about dogs and thinking about, um, my placements and what I could have done differently or what I could do better or what I might have done. So that does give me a lot of, um, a great deal of pleasure. But I think it's important to have a balance. And my, I, I do have a balance now. I don't spend all my time at dog shows. Yeah. I have many other interests in my life. I love art. Um, I, love the, I love exercise. I love the outdoors. I love food. And I have a good group of friends who absolutely think that dog showing is for freaks. <laughs> many of my friends, they, they cannot believe that I would want to go across the world and judge a dog show and you know fly there and fly back and so i have two groups i have the dog show group and i have the normal group and and i think that you know i i've always believed in having those two groups as well because i think having the uh, normal ones gives you um keeps you grounded sometimes because i think you can get, in, get into a little bubble and and forget about what's reality actually so and forget about all the other things there are to to see and do in in our lives and our world absolutely always late or always on time actually i, I can i can answer this because you're a school teacher so it's always on time <laughs> i'm never late absolutely. i'm never late climb a mountain or jump out from a plane jump from a plane i've jumped, I've jumped out of a plane you have i've, sky, I've done skydiving oh, and wow. uh 
Yeah, I did a course um, when I was probably 25 or 30 and went on the training and jumped out of a plane. And in my course, I think there was 15 people and the ambul ambulance came twice, but luckily I was not one of those ones. Seriously? So it was, yep, yeah, it was a static line. You, you, you got out onto the, onto the strut, had your feet on, on there, holding onto the strut, and there was a line so that as you jumped, it, it, it um, released the parachute. And you had an emergency parachute on the front. It was amazing, um, but I've never done it again. Why? Yeah. Because, uh, because the, uh, of the, it was a bit too much of a thrill or because you'd done it, ticked the box? And... I ticked the box. Um, I was not scared at all, but it, you know, it's not one of those things you could do once every three years. You need to be, you need to be, have the, the system so far in ground into your thinking that you almost don't have to think about it. And so you, you need to know that process and be ready for that process. So it's really one of those things you either keep doing or you do it once. So was it a solo jump or a tandem one? Solo. Oh, wow. You jumped out, the parachute came out, you looked down to an arrow on the ground, which was telling you which way to go, and you landed by yourself. Amazing, amazing, wow. Okay, that's something I want to do, it's on my bucket list. Um, what is the thing you're most afraid of? Oh, God. Um, old age. <laughs> um, not being able to do everything I want to do. Um, if I, if I, you know, I, I'm one of those people that really want to live a good life. And once I can't live that good life, I hope I'm gone. Okay. I don't want to be old and infirm. Yeah. Good point. Breeders and exhibitors or judges, who influences a breed the most? Sometimes the judges, but if it's a breed with a good base of exhibitors, you know, like a, not a rare breed, then, then really um, quite often the breeders do still have a big say. But in saying that, you do see times when a breed heads in a direction you, that you don't see as typical to the, to the standard. Um, with, with dogs that are um, flashy and showy and not really of good type. So it certainly can happen. And in some continents, it happens more than in others where flashiness and showiness and coats and the dress of the handler takes more and, and social media and advertising are more likely to um, influence than in others. So would you? So it's it, it's a fifty fifty. You're saying fifty fifty that it's it's both uh, breeders and exhibitors plus judges that are influencing it. No one has yeah. a bit more. Okay. Okay. Oh, uh, you know, I, I would take it a different way in different breeds. Okay. In some breeds, I can see it where a breed has got away um, with with certain dogs being awarded. And it can and can have negative effect on the type of the breed in that country, but you know generally in Australia, um, I would say that usually the breeders and the exhibitors have a fair bit to say about the the breed direction. Okay, excellent. Uh, do you have a nickname your parents used to call you? My nickname is Bertie, <laughs> and it was called, it was called to me by my um, family. And it is called to me um, by older students at the school. The younger ones have to say Mr. Bert, but once they get older, it's often Bertie. <laughs> I like Bertie. <laughs> I think I might stick to Bertie too. <laughs> so that, this, the next question, obviously, I can self-answer. Uh, and the question is going to be at school, were you a nerd or a dude? I'm sure you were a nerd. <laughs> I was. A nerd I'm or a dude? <laughs> I was a nerd. I was a nerd. I can, I can imagine. <laughs> All right. Um, three people that are alive you'd like to be stuck on, a, on an island with? Mm. 
Well, they they probably wouldn't be dog show people. Um, <laughs> they probably wouldn't. You know, but, but they're, they're, some of the dog show people I would choose have now passed away, and and I don't have that option to choose them. Um, but there are, you know, there's a number of dog show people, and it would be very hard that are all on a level, to, you know, to choose three. I would probably choose, you know, um, someone who's who's um, oh, who am I going to choose? Who am I going to choose? It doesn't have to be a dog show person. It can be, you know, anyone dead or alive, someone famous, you know, like uh, I don't know, MacGyver, someone like that. Who? You know, someone MacGyver. Who can build, MacGyver. He can build you a house, you know, with uh, two bits of coconut and whatever. I'll have to think on that one. Give me a minute. Okay. Um, what's one superpower you'd like to have? I would like to be able to um, be invisible. Be invisible? I would like to be able to be played and see what was going on without anyone knowing I was there. <laughs> I, would really, I would really like that. Me too. Do you snore? Yes. Okay. Badly. <laughs> If you could travel Not back... Badly, my father. My father, um, we used to be able to, when we came home late, we could tell at the letterbox whether he was asleep. It's true. You could hear him snoring at the letterbox. Sounds like my father. Not he, could, he could be in a locked room upstairs and you could hear him from the front door. Um, I don't know how my mother slept with him for 63 or 64 years, <laughs> but she does it. If you could travel back in time, what period of time would you go back to? Oh, uh, you know, um, I was, I was, I was a, a little bit young to really enjoy the sixties and I would have, I would love to go back and be a little bit older in the sixties and make the most of it. I reckon it'd be a fantastic why, time. Why the sixties? Is it because of free love and uh, everyone is happy? All and that. I love, I love that, that, whole idea and that whole conception of um, the freedom and, and everything they did at that time. But I was just a little bit too young to really to get into that. But I think that's a, that was a wonderful time and a, a time of great exploration. And um, yes, in some ways, I, I just missed that a little bit. Okay. And if, if, I, if I asked you the same question based on um, in the dog world, which era of the dog world would you have liked to have been born into? You know, I, I think that um, my, when I started in the dog world, which was the early to mid seventies was a fantastic time. Okay. You know, the, the dogs that were around at that time in many breeds were absolutely outstanding if i think back to that time and breeds like irish setters which we now get 10 or 15 at a show afghan hounds which we probably get five at a show now open dog classes of afghan hounds um there were there were some absolutely fantastic dachshunds mm -hmm. in australia at that time yeah um well i think that was a very heady time um maybe because we we had uh, some imports coming in to to um, complement and to develop some breeds at that time, but there were fantastic dogs around. Now some breeds now have come to the front, and you know they weren't in existence or were not great at, at that time. But those big you know Labradors, Irish Setters, English Setters. Um, many, especially Afghan hounds, were absolutely fantastic back in the 70s. I think they were fantastic times. But when you say fantastic times, and I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here, um, was it just because it was numerically stronger, or do you think quality was actually better then? No, no, no. There were bigger numbers, but there was the quality was outstanding. Okay. The quality in those breeds is the depth is nowhere near now what it was in you know the mid 70s to the eight the early 80s yeah. 
in those breeds. There was quality and depth. I mean, you mentioned Dachshunds and, you know, you used to get, what, 50 dogs in a class or maybe 30 dogs in a class in those days. You won't even get that in a breed these days, the entire breed. You wouldn't, yeah, you would get at, at, a, at a Royal, which are the, our premier shows. You know, I, I remember when, um, when Jimmy James came and he judged Irish Setters and that Irish Setter Open Bitch class, I don't know how many were in it, but there, it was enormous and the whole breed took so long. And, um, you know, we might have, at Melbourne Royal now, we'd have 30 to 40 Irish setters. So things have changed in a, a great deal. And there were numerous bitches in, those, in that open bitch class that could have won. Numbers of outstanding bitches. So... Well, you know, interestingly, my first ever dog show in Australia was actually in Melbourne Royal at the old showgrounds. So um, always very fond memories of that old showgrounds and, and of the Royal show. It was okay. an institution. Are you, a, are you a dancer or a singer? Definitely a dancer. I can't sing for quids. <laughs> Tone deaf. Um, what global issues move you the most? Uh, Wales. Wales is, is a big one for me, and I still think that's an enormous issue. And... You know, I, I am sympathetic to whales and dolphins and, and the, the, whilst I understand that they're part of uh, the culture of certain countries, yeah. um, you know, the, the killing and, and eating of them, I, I, um, I think that's, a, that's something that's close to my heart. And of course, um, world climate change and global warming is another one. There is, you know, there is definite change and it's something that we all need to think about and act upon. Yeah. Well, they said that the um, largest hole in the ozone layer has actually healed during this um, time of lockdown across the world uh, and, and you know, all that. So must be true. Well, I know that petrol, the petrol is half the price in our country that it was beforehand. Well, it's... Um, no one's driving. Petrol's cheaper than, and, than beer in our country. So there you go. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. All right. What's your biggest pet peeve with exhibitors whilst you're judging? Feeding the dogs in front of me. I don't mind you. I don't mind baiting the dogs, but when the when the food is held and it's in the mouth, and when you get to the front and the dog is chewing, it really annoys me. But I think that is one, and another is choosing the speed of movement that is suitable for your dog and it shows the typical movement rather than the flying movement is something that you know many people don't understand. And I, I, I often see a generic gait in a ring that's not what the dog should do. And if the speed was changed, the dog would most probably exhibit a typical gait. Agree, I totally agree with you on that one. Um, what fashion trend do you just not get? Um, well, what one would I go for most? I, I certainly uh, never got the crop top. I never got the crop top. I, I was not a fan of the crop top. But um, nowadays, uh, I'm not a fan of, we have many, um, you know, we have a casual dress day at school and the boys wearing their pants down low with that baggy bum part, I cannot get. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's not for me. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a sight to see sometimes. Um, no. Apple or Android? Um, did you say Apple? Yeah. What Apple, did you say? Apple, Apple. Or Android. All the way, I'm Apple all the way. It's dropping in my estimation now. Um, jazz or blues? Blues. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, breed clubs or national club? Who forms the building blocks of a solid foundation for a breed? Well, that's also, an interesting... For the dog game, actually, in general. Yeah, I, I think it should be the breed clubs. And, uh, you know, I have just become president of the National 
Breed Count, Bullmaster Breed Council in Australia okay. um, this month. And that is uh, sort of the, the umbrella over the four state breed clubs that exist. And I think that breed clubs, you know, it's, it's, it's very important and they need to play a big part. We've got a big issue here at the moment to do with the um, British Bulldog standard. And um, the ANKC spoke to the British Bulldog clubs about the standard. And obviously the breed health comes into it and they wanted them to decide upon whether they took on the, because we had what's called the pre-87 pre standard. So it wasn't changing with the country of origin one. And that was meant to be kept as the pre-87 standard. The Bulldog Club wouldn't answer the ANKC and the ANKC now has made changes to the standard. They've altered the standard in some ways and added certain bits of health. My view was always that it should always should be country of origin standard. That's, I think that the country, you know, we have an Australian cattle dog standard. I would not like anyone to be altering that standard. That is our standard and we do the call. I think with the British Bulldog standard, we should be going with the, um, the Kennel Club standard and if they choose, which they did to make some changes, then that ripple on effect should happen across the world. Um, but, but again, it's the breed clubs. But can I just ask you, the, the changes that you ANKC, agree? The changes that ANKC made, was it because of health issues or things in your country that they had to come along uh, lines with to follow guidelines? Was that the reason? It was, uh, it was a, um, a moderating of the British Bulldog standard for health reasons you know, taking out some of the extreme words and making it a slightly more moderate standard, which is probably similar to what the UK did um, when they yeah. modified that a little bit. Yeah. But I just think we should have had the UK standard and gone with that. Country of origin, all the way for me. Yeah, I agree. But unfortunately, when you judge, you have to go with whatever's in front of you, standard-wise. Yeah. Um, but as you, as you say, you know, when you take it from a national point of view, if your national breed and another country changes the um, standards for your national breed, it's not something that you'd really, you know, accept. Um, no. Arms. But, but then again, some continents are more likely to change standards to suit themselves than others. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Um, okay. Where are we? Are you a Game of Thrones fan? No. Harry Potter? I've watched some of the Harry Potters, but to be honest, Gopi, I, li I like to watch um, movies that I think are real. I'm not very keen on things that would not really happen. So I stick to, stick to the real things. And, and when you do go for, the, for a movie, uh, what sort of genre do you like to watch? Is it comedies, romance? Uh, what, what? I like thrillers. Okay. I like comedies. Um, I'm not particularly big on romance, but, um, you know, I'm, I don't mind a bit of a tearjerker in some ways, something, that, something like that, but, but it's got to be real. I'm probably one of the few people that has never watched a Star Wars. Um, there's another. <laughs> uh, first celebrity crush. Who was your first celebrity crush? That would have to go, you know, way, 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 way back. This will make you laugh. That um, when I was a child, there was a TV show and uh, it was the, called The Happy Show. And, and we actually went as children. My parents took us. And there was, uh, it was run by Happy Hammond. But his offsider, who I did have a crush on, her name was Princess Panda. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This, is, this, this Panda... 55 years ago. We, could, we can't run away from this panda. Keeps keeps cropping up. There's yes. a there's thing here. All right. Um, beach house or mountain cabin? Beach house. I love the beach. Okay. Um, online dog shows, yes or no? No. Uh, I've been, I chose not to do it. I've agreed to do an online handling competition where the 
for, to make some money for one of the states in Australia and they're going to video the, the kids do it and they're going to do their triangle and whatever else and stand the dog up. I'm happy to be involved in that. But, um, you know, I've had this argument with some friends of mine and each to their own. But if I'm going to judge a dog, I want to look in its mouth, I want to feel its muscles and I want to feel under that coat. And I want it to be me making a, a, a full decision with all information. But by the same token, in, in times like this, if people choose to do that and it helps them get through these very difficult times, good luck to them, but it's just not for me. And, and talking of difficult times, actually, um, can you tell us a little bit about um, the lockdown that's going on in Australia? I know state to state it's different and, and it affects different uh, people, but what can you do? What can't you guys do? Uh, schools, that sort of thing. Can you just tell us a little bit about that, please? So it, I suppose one of the difficulties in Australia is that because we're so vast, um, the rules have been different in, in different areas of Australia. And the federal government, um, the Australian Prime Minister wanted to keep schools open. And uh, where I live in Victoria, our, um, our Victorian government decided very early, we were one of the first to close the schools. And, um, and to embrace remote learning. Um, but generally, there, we are still in pretty much a lockdown. Um, people are being fined $1,600, $1,700 if they're out of their house without reason. You can go to work, you can go shopping, um, you can, uh, shopping when you say shopping for groceries and stuff like that, not, yeah. not to go shopping centre. Shop, groceries, Bunnings, you can go to Bunnings, the hardware. Everyone is doing all their do-it-yourself do projects at home in the garden and the house. Um, you can, if you don't live with your partner, you can visit your partner. That changed within Victoria very quickly. Um, and it, it's a maximum of two people being in a, in a gathering. If there's more than two, you're in strife. But I do think that um, we're doing a lot of testing in Victoria. They want to test 100,000 over the next couple of weeks, and then they're going to make the decisions, and we will be slowly, because um, we've really flattened. Our, our rate of infection is very low, yeah. and you know we will start to come out of this. But the big, you know, it's been hard for people with mental health issues, and that's come to the fore. But I feel most sorry for many businesses that I'm not sure, you know, how they'll come back from this in some cases. And the sooner that it's safe for us to move back in some ways and and reduce um, the restrictions, the better it will be for business and the economy. It's very hard for the for some areas. Of in Australia, your borders are closed, not just internationally, but even within your states, right? There's some states that you can't travel to. Yep. Yep. There are st um, I think, I'm not sure about Victoria to New South Wales, but the rest of them are basically closed. There's no restaurants. You can't go and sit in the park. You can't go to the beach. Um, you, you can't, you can go for a walk and exercise with people in your family in, or in your house, but not with others. So you can walk the dog and you can go for a walk and I go for a walk, but you stay away from other people and, um, and you don't sit down at any park bench and have a chat or do anything like that. You just keep moving and you come back to your house, you go and buy your food. Most of the, in Victoria, um, all the doctor's appointments are via video, unless it's something that's extremely you know, difficult, then uh, they might call you in. But other than that, it's by video. So it's been, you know, our, but our, um, our responses have been strong and our regulations, but that's paid off um, in that's terms it. of it's where we're at. We had, one, we had one big error, I think, and that was with the, the boat in Sydney where they let the people off. And um, many of those people went back into society and that led to some outbreaks and some in Tasmania and a few other places. But other than that, we've done pretty well. And and um, with 
with uh, this, uh, I mean, obviously this video is being done during the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, what does it look like? How how a dog show is going to look like? You think post post um, COVID nineteen? That's really yet to be decided. And what I hope is the dog shows don't go back too soon. You know, if, if we're going back to a stage where there's masks or gloves, then I don't think we should be going back. I think we need to get to a stage where it's much more safe than that before we have dog shows. Yeah. And obviously dog shows with local judges will happen here before judges, uh, dog shows with international judges. Um, and the same for me, you know, I've missed a number of appointments, but overseas or had them postponed. Yeah. Um, but in, it's a dog show. It's yeah. compared to people's health and the economy. It's, it's far, far below that. But I, I, I'm, I'm, I've always been one to shake hands with every person that I judge their dog um, and shake hands with them all and thank them. I don't know. I've wondered about whether that'll be... Um, acceptable in the future. I'm not sure. Will we, will we watch that? Funny you mentioned Pardon? that. Funny you mentioned that because when I was in Japan, the last assignment I had, which was mid March, and uh, we were not allowed to shake hands with them, and we were not allowed to mouth the dogs, and I just found that so weird. It sort of threw my whole judging. I had to really yeah. think again about how I did because, like you, I like to shake people's hands and you know uh, that sort of things, and it was just. It was it's something to do with that thinking. I judged the day before, um, you know, I was co contracted and I went in and did my job and judged in Melbourne the day before dog shows closed down. And uh, on almost every occasion, they mouth their dogs. Some exhibitors are hopeless. Some exhibitors have no idea how to mouth their own dogs. Um, and I probably did a couple and then went and washed my hands. But the rest of the, the um, entry mouth their own dogs. And I quite often would have go to shake hands before I even thought about it. And I had to be very careful of that. But it's something that I pride myself on doing and thanking everyone for their entry and shaking their hand. And I hope that does come back to dog shows, but I don't know. And some people won't want to shake your hands. Well, here, you know, even outside of dog shows here, uh, it's the new normal to wear, to be masked when you're outside of your home or your car. Um, it's just, you know, it's again, it's taken a bit of doing, but it, people have adapted very quickly and, and you hardly see anyone without a mask out when they're outdoors. Um, so. Well, we're not like that. We would, you, there would be, I don't know, one in 10 have a mask. Um, and partly that was because we couldn't get masks yeah. at first. Yeah. Um, no one had, you could not get masks and you could not get hand sanitizer, yeah. let alone toilet paper. But um, let's we've not moved past on. those things now. <laughs> <laughs> let's not go into the toilet paper pandemic of 2020. Well, <laughs> I was very lucky. My parents moved into care and they left a cupboard full of toilet paper. So I had plenty and shared some with my friends. <laughs> so next time anyone's short of a... So do you, do you have this whole experience? What's one thing you've learned about yourself during this pandemic? Um, I've learned how lucky I am because I live alone. I'm le I've learned how lucky I am to be interacting with so many people in my, in my job and my day to day life. Um, and how important that is to me. I, it hasn't been all that easy for me to be at home alone, which, you know, I don't do that often. It's, I, I spend a lot of time with a lot of people and, um, you know, I've had to work at that and I've managed it, but it's not ideal. Yeah. yeah. Um, are you a gym bunny or a couch potato? Both. I go to the gym, but of course there's no gym at the moment. And uh, I do try and go to the gym three times a week. Not that anyone would be able to tell when they see me, but um, I also enjoy the couch and the wine and the food. And uh, I try to balance the three. And, and on, on that food thing, what's your favorite binge food or junk food? Um, I'm, I'm probably, I love pizza. I love good pizza and pasta and you know, eat more of that than I should. But I'm, I am pretty good for cooking and um, 
you know, I, I, I don't buy a lot of takeaway food, but I eat out quite a bit. So, you know, I'm, I'm pizza and pasta. And I'm horrified that you've cl classified pizza as junk food because that's, you know, like <laughs> nutritious. I love pizza. And I love making pizza at home. Well, there you go. Another, another lockdown uh, uh, mystery. Okay, if, um, what is one sentence you'd like to see in your obituary for your time in the dog world? What would you like it to say? He was an honest judge. Can you say that again? Yeah, he was, line went he was an, I'm not kidding. He was, yeah. an, he was an honest judge. Okay, excellent, excellent. All right, Andrew. That's very, very important to me. I, I think I think um, that uh, that says you know because um, I've always believed as a judge or as a human being the only thing you leave behind is your reputation, so uh, you know that's important, and I and I tend to agree with you, Andrew. Thank you so much for um, having given me your time. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. I'm getting to know you a bit better. Uh, thank you. Take care. Stay safe.